I feel privileged and honored to be here and um, delighted that you all decided to come and listen to infection prevention, which we always have problem with. Okay, let me uh, tell you about it uh, while we are talking. Keep this wonderful saying by late Andy Rooney in mind. He was the best American journalist and I honestly believe that's true. Andy Rooney said, I have learned that to ignore the facts does not change the facts. So I tell our employees, no matter what you think about vaccination or hygienic practices, it really does not matter. The facts are facts, they, they are based on scientific investigations. So don't let your feelings, your um, beliefs get into the way of scientific facts. Let me show you the challenges that we have in teaching infection prevention. First and foremost, infection prevention is very basic. And everyone knows exactly what to do to prevent the spread of germs, or at least that's what they think they do. So the second one is the attitude. Look at this. When you're dealing with professionals like doctors or nurses, that's their attitude. You cannot teach me anything that I already don't know. That is really true. That is really true. And when you come to less skilled uh, personnel, such as maybe housekeeping or nursing assistant, that's what the attitude is. With what you pay me, you think I'm creating all those infections. So this is my 29th year at Willis Knight and teaching. I realized if only I keep them awake, they're going to learn something. So I always start by scaring my audience. <laughs> And that's what it is. So, no, really, for the purpose of this half an hour, one hour that we're going to be talking about infection prevention, look at this cute little bunny sitting here as your germs, your microbes, your microorganisms that are everywhere. And look at the mighty dog as human. And this is going to happen to us if we are not careful with these cute little bunnies. I'm not kidding you. That's what's going to happen to us. Oops, sorry. Did I show you something disgusting right at lunch? Whatever. OK, look at this. Let's see who is actually watching healthcare industry. I have to tell you that anyone who works at Willis Knight, and they have to go to strenuous uh, training. First, at orientation, we have three days of orientation, full day for skilled workers such as nurses. And uh, then they have to come back every year because we have to fulfill all these regulatory agencies, such as uh, Center for Medicare, Medicaid Services, as you see right here, or <coughs> CDC, Center for Disease Control and Prevention. Voluntary Hospital Association. If we don't fulfill all these educations, we are not going to get reimbursed by these agencies, private insurances, Medicare, Medicaid. So that's the reason we have to have education. And the reason is because we want to keep our patients safe. Once they go through the orientation, they know exactly what to do in order to avoid spreading the germs. I tell everyone, infection prevention is a team sport. It is your basketball. It is your football. It is not jogging all by yourself on the field. It involves each and every one of us. It's not only the nurses, the housekeepers, the doctors. Patient and family members are involved as much. So it's a team sport. That's what I tell everyone. And who can be affected by healthcare associated infections? First and foremost, employees, including volunteers, clergy, anyone who walks into the hospital, they can be affected by all these germs. And secondly, which is more important to me, is the patient. So let's see what happens. This is according to CDC every year in the United States alone, 1,700,000 people develop some kind of infection simply because they come to the hospital and healthcare workers take care of them. It amounts to three people getting infected every minute, 
4,600 every day. <laughs> and among these people who get infected, approximately 271 of them are going to die because of this infection that they acquired in the hospital. Uh, folks, don't get scared. <laughs> Look at this. In, three, in 30 minutes that we are talking about infection prevention, actually 90 people are going to get infected and 5.6 of them are going to die because of this acquired infection in the hospital. I sat down with my pencil and paper and calculator. I realized this amounts to a crash of an airliner every day of the week of the month of the year, killing 271 people. Do your math. It's the same number. How many of us are going to travel knowing that number? I'm not going to get in that plane. You do. But people come to the hospital and we give them infections. So how are these germs, the spread of these germs can be prevented? Let's see, how did they get around first? I have to tell you a story. I've always um, realized that if I relate my information through story, people are going to grasp it a little better. It's going to stay with them a little bit longer, especially if these are childhood experiences that you have. So I want to tell you this story. One day, a wise owl asked a little cat, that was the question, what is the key to your long life? You know, they say cats have nine lives. Like they get up on the tree, they fall down, break a limb, then they get up, they get under the car, flat as a pancake, then they start all over again. So this was the answer. The cat said, keeping myself clean. You know, they lick themselves clean. As a matter of fact, when I was preparing with this module, I realized that all animals do it. What happens the first thing they do when the babies are born? They lick him. I'm so glad we don't do that to our offspring. Can you imagine licking your baby clean? Anyhow, but that's what they do. Look at this. Birds get in the water not only to drink, but also to clean themselves. And what do they do when there is no water? How do they clean themselves? They roll in the dirt. It gets the mites and parasites off. It's a cleaning process. Look at this one. Before coming to the United States in 1975, I had never ever seen a raccoon. I did not know that they wash their food. Teach it to my kids. No, really, they wash their food before eating. And primates, they love to groom each other because they want to have a clean partner. And folks, as I was preparing for these, I came across these pictures. <laughs> it doesn't matter, male or female, Democrat or Republican or black and white or oriental, it doesn't matter, they all do it. And then look. <laughs> So sorry, right at lunch, that's what happens. Look at this one. This gentleman is sneezing without covering his sneeze. Whatever he has in this wonderful creation, if there is cold or flu, it's going to stay on different surfaces for a good six to eight hours. What? Yes, sir, six to eight hours. Absolutely. Anyone touching that surface, they're going to contract it. Now, this one is doing a little better. He's covering his sneeze, but he's touching the rail, and this poor little guy is coming right afterward, touching the same spot, getting whatever has. So that's what they do now. They teach kids to do their cough and sneezes in their sleeves. And please don't think that these are too elementary. I talk to doctors even, and they look at me, um, Really, uh, that makes sense. Kind of, sort of makes sense. And that, that is reality behind it. So if you want to uh, cover your sneeze and cough, that's the best place, in your elbow. Look at this one. According to the CDC, one third of us do not wash hands after using bathroom. So keep this picture in mind. Avoid every third person. Don't shake hands with them. I wish it would work that way. It doesn't. We don't know who is clean and who is not. That's why they went to bumping fist. I like that much better. You know why? Because, sir, can we do the bump fisting? When you do the bump fist, uh, fisting, uh, fisting your bump, first of all, there is less surface versus the whole hand. Say, I just wash my hands. 
versus the whole hand. So there is less surface and there is less time. So that's why they say go with uh, bumping your fist. Mm. And I understand President Obama endorsed that. I don't know how socially acceptable that is. Going to Mr. Putin, hey, Mr. Putin. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I'm proud of him for endorsing that. So let's see how these, uh, we can prevent the spread of these germs. First and foremost, hand washing. And again, please don't think this is too elementary. How dare you to tell me to wash my hands? Hand hygiene for anyone who has hands. Now, I want to ask you all a question. Other than healthcare workers working in the hospital, who else has hands? <laughs> Patients, family members. And now the focus is toward teaching the patient and family members to wash your hands. Because these people come from outside the world, and God knows what they bring with them. So anyone with hands, they have to wash their hands. I came across this article. They did a study. Among 100 patients admitted to the hospital, only 48 hours ad after admit, they realized 39% of these hands were contaminated with one pathogen, at least one pathogen, germ-causing diseases. And 8% of these hands were contaminated with two or more. So that's why I tell nurses, no matter where you work, if your patient cannot get up and go to the bathroom to wash their hands, please give them a washcloth with a little alcohol several times a day to disinfect their hands. Because you have seen them touching their lines, IVs, and all that. And that is a source of infection. And we can reduce these infections if we all do that. They changed the name of hand washing to hand hygiene. It's all because of this wonderful container that contains alcohol. Folks, alcohol kills lots of germs. It kills your cold, it kills your flu, it kills your staph, it kills the Ebola. But there is this organism called C. diff. Anyone ever heard of it? It is awful. It causes severe diarrhea, even in healthy individuals. And C. diff cannot be touched by alcohol. So I tell nurses, if your patient has diarrhea, even if you don't know they have C. diff, please remove the alcohol from the room. So if I were you, not knowing what patient has what, who, who has what, I would never use alcohol. I always wash my hands, because you really don't know what, what the background behind all these people. So see, I didn't put here. Wash your hands before coming out of the bathroom or after or anything like that. This is the minimum of the time. Anyone walking into the hospital to a patient's room, they must disinfect their hands. Upon entering the patient's room, because we already touched the elevator button, the handrail that the guy sneezed on, so we want to stop the uh, transmission of these germs. And after patient contact or contact with any item in the patient's room, because they're heavily contaminated. So we don't want to take them to someone else or our family members, another patient. Now, folks, this is a million dollar poster. I wish I had come up with that. In 2009, World Health Organization, we call it WHO, came up with this contest among these countries. This was 2009. They told all these countries to come up with a poster simple for hand hygiene, hand washing. And they came up with this, and this won a million dollars. Look at this. First, we wash our hands before touching a patient. It's given. Second, before cleaning or aseptic procedure. Third, after body fluid exposure, if they come in contact with urine, blood, or anything like that. After touching a patient and after touching patient surrounding, a million dollars. Gosh, I wish I had done that. Anyhow, there goes my chance. Now, if you go to a patient's room and patient told you that, please do not get offended. I told you now the focus is the patient and the family. They give them pamphlets. They show them videos. It's your right to ask me to wash my hands before coming near you. As a matter of fact, they did a study they realized if they put the patient in charge of observation and intervention, 
96.8% of healthcare workers, they're going to comply with hand washing. The doctor walks in, the patient has been trained, sir, would you wash your hands before coming near, e near me? And they do. So please do not get insulted if that's what the patient is demanding. Now, let's see if clean hands really and truly saves lives. This cute little baby boy, only five months old, the baby dies as a result of some kind of respiratory virus, as you see right here. When they investigated, they realized that the baby next bed had the identical bug. You know, they have cameras everywhere these days now. They know exactly who is doing what. They realized that a consultant physician, a pediatrician, went from that baby to this one at least once without washing his hands, taking the germ to kill this baby. So that's why they say hand washing really and truly uh, saves lives. Look at this one. Wait, this one's a lawyer. We would better wash our hands. That is true. <laughs> The other thing that we can do to prevent the spread of this germ is cleaning the equipment, even wheelchair. If it goes from one room to another, they have to be disinfected with sunny wipes. I have to tell you that I have a good friend. She lives in another state. She does not live in Louisiana. She was very obese. She lost 80 pounds. She looked beautiful. But she had these big flaps of skin, so she had to have a surgery. She went through the surgery. She sent me the picture. Two weeks after surgery, uh, she was at home. She showed me the picture. Pus was dripping from both sides. They said when she was going home, she put her arms on the wheelchair, and it was contaminated with staff, MRSA specifically. And that's what, uh, how she got her infection. So that's why it's so crucial to disinfect all these items. Look at this. All these uh, points in patients' room, they are heavily contaminated with these germs. I wish we could see these germs. That is the problem. We cannot see the germs. Now, you might want to ask me, as a volunteer, what can I do to protect myself? And believe it or not, lots of time, when I get to this point of my talk, I see my class eyes are just getting larger and larger. Oh boy, what am I getting into? So what can we do to protect ourselves so we don't end up with these germs and not to take them home, share them with our family members? Folks, even if you're a physician, if you're a nurse, if you're a housekeeper, this is the only thing that we can do to protect ourselves. We call it standard precaution. <coughs> standard precaution means assuming everybody is infected. Did you know I'm HIV infected? You folks have no idea I'm HIV infected. This young man sitting here, he has hepatitis. This gentleman has C. diff. You assume everybody is infected. Avoid their blood and body fluid. Now, if you're a nurse, you might, might want to ask me, how do I avoid your blood and body fluid if I'm supposed to take care of you? By washing your hands every time you touch a patient's skin, or any item that is touched by someone else, including the doorknob. Wearing gloves, if you think your hands are going to come in contact with blood or body fluid, and taking them off and washing our hands afterward. Protecting our face and mucous membrane with mask and goggles, if you think there's a chance of body fluid to be splashed to your face. Protecting your uniform with a gown if you think there is a body fluid splash again. And I tell employees, please do not take your heavily contaminated uniform home. Did you know that we have disposable scrubs for all of our employees, different sizes? So if they get their uniform dirty at work, they can use that service. And we laundry, they launder their own uh, uniform. So we tell them to use these services that are available for you at Willis Night 10. Also, if you find a, let's say you find a broken piece of glass on the floor or a needle, don't pick it up with bare hands because there is a chance that you get exposed to it. And we never put these items in trash because it might tear the bag, pose a danger to the person who is picking up the trash. 
this is another way that we can protect ourselves. Let's talk about this deadly virus that scared us so bad last year around this time. And it is not gone. The reason we don't hear about it because we don't have it in the United States at this moment. So let's see what this uh, virus is, Ebola. The reason I put this here because I want to make a comparison. Ebola is not a new virus at all. It has always been in nature. Uh, but the first time they identified it was actually in 1996. It was in um, Congo, Republic of Con Congo. They found it by the Ebola River. That's why they call it Ebola. It used to be called Zaire. In the past, these natives would get infected. You know how would they would get infected? By eating a specific animal. Do you know what that was? Fruit bats. Fruit bats. They would eat fruit bats that they were uh, infected with the virus. I think I would do the same too if I didn't have access to Kroger or Albertson or anything like that. Don't get disgusted. It's part of the culture. They would get infected. Unfortunately, they would die. But now everybody is mobile. They get in a plane. Uh, they get in a train, a bus, go to another city, and I promise you, it's just a plain ride from your doorstep. Let's go over signs and symptoms. Uh, we have two sets of signs and symptoms. One is the early stages. Early stages is fever, coughing, and body ache. Folks, what other disease you know gives you the exact same thing? Thank you, flu, absolutely. Then we have advanced stage. First of all, it starts with uh, bruising. Look at the bruising. This is the bruising. It's not like bumping into something, pockets of blood under the skin. Then the patient starts uh, having bleeding from all orifices of the body, nose, mouth, uh, eyes, rectum, they all have lots of blood, kidney failure, severe diarrhea. Now, let me show you this one as well. The patient is extremely contagious when they have rashes or any of these body fluid. And usually people, when they're exposed between eight to 10 days after exposure, they develop Ebola signs and symptoms. I'm very proud that Willis Knighton had a great policy even before CDC mandated it. This is our policy. If a patient comes to the emergency room or quick care and has fever of 100.4 or greater, can you imagine how many patients go to the emergency room with that? If they have an additional symptom such as diarrhea or vomiting, we have these signs posted. Have you been traveling to any of these countries, Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone? Sierra Leone at one time got rid of Ebola, but now it's back there. So if the answer is yes, and the patient was exposed to Ebola virus disease, right away we put the policy, the guideline in place. We notify health unit, infection prevention chair, Dr. Coughlin is gonna be notified. Patient is gonna be placed in isolation, and that's our policy is. What can you do for these people? There is no vaccine, they're working on it. There is no medication. The only thing that they can do is giving them IV fluid, lots of fluids. Usually they have four lines, all extremities getting fluid. And you know what they do in Africa since they don't have access to all the medical uh, equipments that we have? They boil water, add salt and sugar, which works like electrolyte, and they give them sip by sip. And it works. If they are not terminal, it usually works. Now, ladies and gentlemen, there is another virus which comes to the northern hemisphere. That's where we are. Every fall, 5 to 20% of us sitting in this room, we are going to acquire it. And 200,000 of us are going to end up in the hospital, as you see right there. Look at the mortality compared with this deadly virus. For one year, we had between 30 to 40,000 people dying from this deadly virus. What is that? Flu, influenza, absolutely. Influ and we have a vaccine for it. Now let me talk about the flu. 
I'm so disappointed that CDC does not mandate vaccination for employees. That is very unfortunate. But we are required at the end of the season, which is March 31st, to report to the government the number of employees who got their vaccine and those who declined it. And we highly recommend for everybody to get their vaccine. The only exception would be person who is allergic to eggs or if they have shown a bad reaction like that. Achy arm doesn't count. I got my vaccine uh, two weeks ago and my arm was aching, so I took an Aleve. A Tylenol would do. It takes two weeks to develop antibody. Usually people tell me, it doesn't matter if I get my flu shot or not. I'm going to end up with the flu anyhow. That's not true. That is not true. And this year, you need to know that there are four viruses in that vaccine, which is, we always had three. But this year, they put there four. So we are even more immune. There, is, there are lots of people who are scared of needle. They really are. Two weeks ago, I was giving vaccine at the Innovation Center flu shot, uh, and we had a very good line. All of a sudden, we heard commotion. I looked at the door, and a whole bunch of women were trying to push this woman in the room. I said, what's going on? They said, she's very scared of needle, so we are trying to uh, comfort her. I said, don't worry. I'm going to I saved my smallest needle for you. They're all the same size. <laughs> but anyhow, I said, you, you, don't worry. I'll be very gentle with you. She sat down. I pulled the arm up. I'm not kidding you. She had tattoos from here to here. Wow. <laughs> I said, what? Pardon me. I said, what the heck is that? <laughs> She said, I paid lots of money to numb it first. I wanted to say, you're ridiculous. I said, Faye, you better bite your tongue. I said, you are funny. <laughs> I said, I saved my largest needle for you. You earned it. <laughs> so that is, that's the frame of thought. She goes, get 100 needles for tattoo, but one flu shot, no way. <laughs> Look at this one. Uh, this hospital in New Jersey. Uh, this is the statistics that they had from last year that they released August of this year. They said when we mandated people, their employees, to have the vaccine, the compliance was 95%, as you see right there. 95% of their employees, they got their vaccine after it was mandated. So lots of people need just a little push. Even if they're pregnant, they can have their vaccine. Even if they're HIV infected, they can they have va the, their vaccine. The only person is the one who's allergic to eggs or if they have shown a previous bad reaction. Look at this one. This sweet little lady, she's only 35 years old. She develops leukemia. They find her a perfect match. She goes through bone marrow transplant. She loses all her hair, but she's completely re recovered. She even grows her hair back. She goes to see the doctor, the nurse taking care of her. She does not have fever. She is not coughing. All she has is a tiny little runny nose. And that's what happened to the patient. It happens every day. If we, I tell nurses, if you're dealing with patients, we need to protect themselves as well as ours. And I'm very proud that California decided to mandate vaccination for all their children. And they said if parents decide not to vaccinate their children, they need to do the homeschooling, which is the right thing to do, because they're posing a danger to the rest of the community. What do you, to do if you have the cold or the flu? Rest. That's the best thing we can do. Rest, rest, rest. Drink plenty of uh, fluids, juice, water. Don't take antibiotics. Sometimes the doctor orders antibiotics because they don't want superimposed bacterial infection. Because vi uh, flu is a virus, and viruses are not touched by antibiotics. And take medication to relieve the fever, coughing, and all that. Wash your hands as often as possible and avoid sick people. My husband and I, we have a policy. We never go to movies 
from September all the way to the March. <laughs> because everybody is sniffling and we don't want to get exposed in a crowded place. So avoid these places if you possibly can. This is the sign that you see at the door. Please do not enter this room. You have to have a mask, a regular surgical mask in order to en enter that room. I would not visit, if I were you, I would not visit a patient with the flu. I wait till they are lifted from the uh, isolation, then I would visit them. This is another vaccine, shingles. Shingles vaccine for any, I don't see anyone older than 55 years of age here. <laughs> if you know someone who is older than 55 years, please make sure you tell them, get your shingles vaccine. We get lots of calls from nurses. Nurse calls, Faye, I'm supposed to take care of this patient with shingles all over. These are the lesions, look at the lesions. Would I get shingles from this patient? The question to ask is, have you had your chicken pox? Because if you, as a child, develop chicken pox, the virus stays in your body for the rest of your life. Then it flares up in form of shingles when our immune system goes down, like a major surgery, a great stress in our life. Shingles virus is going to get activated. So if the nurse did not have chicken pox, she's going to get chicken pox from this patient who has shingles. Otherwise, she has nothing to worry about. Now we have this Zostovax vaccine, which is fantastic. And uh, your insurance pays for most of it. So I took mine the other day, and I'm pleased. If I get shingles, it's going to be much milder. The other vaccine that is uh, highly recommended for adults is the pneumonia vaccine. With the pneumonia vaccine, anyone, I, again, no one is older than 65 years here. If you know someone older than 65 years of age, tell them, get your pneumonia vaccine. You need one shot for the rest of your life, except for the ones who get, uh, on, go under chemotherapy or hemodialysis. It wears off from their body. In that case, they need one every five years. But for the rest of us, if you have healthy immune system, one shot of pneumonia is good enough for life. And this is what I want you, I'm begging you to do. Please, when you visit patient and family members, encourage them to get their vaccines, all their vaccines. And please endorse blood uh, donation, organ transplantation. They look up to you, no matter what the religion is. Look at this. I love this saying, don't take your organs to heaven. Heaven knows we re really need them right here on earth. Now, share life, give what? Thank you. I have to tell you a story. We all have a little bucket list of all the things that we want to do before we leave this wonderful place, go somewhere else, in my case. <laughs> in my bucket list, Giving blood is one of them. You have to be at least 110 pounds in order to give blood. I'm not 110 yet, but I'm inching up toward that. But I have to tell you a story. Uh, two years ago, one of my sisters who lives back home in Iran, I'm from Iran, she came to visit me. One day we didn't, uh, we didn't have anything else to do, so I took her to my favorite place, <coughs> Sam's. <laughs> They feed you, you see all kinds of people. But before we got to Sam's, I saw this giant life share bus parked there. So I wanted to teach, educate my sister. I said, do you know what that is? She said, yeah, that's public transportation. I said, no, that's not public transportation. That is the portable blood collecting unit. She said, what is that? Because back home, you have to go to the hospital to give blood or get blood. I said, well. People go there, they draw their blood, then they process it, and we have such a shortage. She said, well, we have time. Do you want me to go give blood? She's a little chubbier than me. I said, yeah, sure, do you want to go? I said, yeah, OK. So we went up the stairs. There were two steps in there. And this poor little girl was sitting there all by herself, flipping the pages of this magazine. She was so happy to see two people coming up the step. She said, you girls want to give blood? I said, well. 
my sister is giving blood. I can't. She looked at me and said, you look kind of puny. I said, well, <laughs> thank you. I'm going to grow up someday. Anyhow, um, she gave us this questionnaire. I'm not kidding you. It took me a good 10, 15 minutes to translate. OK, have you had tattoos? She said, I never had tattoos. OK, have you had sex with such and such man? She said, hush up. I said, well, this. <laughs> She has been married to this wonderful man for the past 40 years. And I said, but he's asking us. You have to answer. So anyhow, we had so much fun filling the phone. And the girl told us, oh, I'm going to give you cookies and orange juice, a gift card from Walmart. I said, yes, we're going to go shopping after work. <laughs> when we finished, I handed her the questionnaire. The first thing she looked at, oh, she's been out of the country for more than six months. Well, she lives somewhere else. She said, I'm so sorry. Tossed it just like that in trash. Mm -hmm. So if you're out of the country for a certain number of months, you have to be back for a certain number of months in order to give blood. And besides, we all are getting older. I'm getting, I don't know about you all. We need blood. Who can afford giving blood? That's why I said, please encourage your patients to give blood, because that is a wonderful way to share life. Since I cannot give blood, I'm a full bone marrow donor. This is my card. If anyone needs my um, bone marrow, I'd be more than happy to share. And besides, I'm a full organ donor, as you see right there. If you're an organ donor, make sure you have this heart on your driver's license. Oh, boy. They put my height 407. How dare you? I'm 408. <laughs> but I'm not 100 pounds anymore. I'm 107. I'm inching up toward my goal. This is another issue that we have. We all have to have TB skin tests if we are dealing with people. And when someone is posi positive for TB skin test, it does not mean that they have TB. If it looks like that, it's negative. In order to be positive, it has to have in duration. It is not the redness. That's why we all need to know our status when it comes to PPD. If you see this sign at the door, please do not enter this room. This patient has TB. We have to have a, a mask like this. All of our employees who go to this room they have to wear a mask like this. So if you have this patient, do not visit them, please. You can call them, and whatever uh, prayer that you have, you can do over the phone. Do not enter this room. Uh, no, staph infection. You all heard of staph infection? Relax. The staph infection will get you before the flu. That's unfortunate. Lots of time. Patient comes to the emergency room with a big abscess like that. Do you know what they diagnose it? It is associated with a bug. Yes. They say you have spider bite. Look at this one. This is a real spider bite. This is a um, staph infection. It doesn't even have to be a um, black widow. All spiders, when they bite, it causes necrosis. Uh, the other day, a nurse came to me. She was so frustrated. She said, Faye, you have to see how I open doors. I said, how do you open doors? She said, well, if I don't have tissue, I go like this. Or, OK, you don't want to touch the door now. No, but I keep getting reinfected with staff. I said, uh, 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 you do not get reinfected. You are colonized. Unfortunately, 5 to 20% of healthcare workers, when they're exposed to staff, they get colonized. It stays in their nose or different parts of their body. So do standard precautions, washing hands, gloves, and all that that I showed you, in order to avoid colonization. That's the only thing that we can do. Uh, look at this one. This was World War II, 1940s or so. Penicillin at that time was the magic bullet, killing all these germs. But that does not apply anymore. And that's why. I'm so full of antibiotics, every time you sneeze, I kill someone. <laughs> and when they put us on antibiotics, we don't finish the course. We take a few doses. The rest of them stay in the medicine cabinet for the next time or next person. That's why we have resistant organisms. 
I came across this, it, came, it was fascinating to me. During the Civil War, 1860s or so, uh, soldiers who got wounds, uh, the Confederate soldiers, had a much greater chance of survival. You know why? Because these Yankees had all the money, they would buy these expensive bandages and all that, and they didn't want to get rid of them. They would wash them and reuse them. But uh, Southerners, they didn't have all that money, so they would use rags. They would cut a rag, tear a rag, wrap the wound, and afterward they would burn it, throw it in fire. So they did not have as many wound infections as the Yankees. I thought that is fascinating because washing does not get rid of it on these bandages and all that. It does not kill it. So I thought that's a good piece of information to share. <coughs> this woman went through a cosmetic surgery, developing staph infection afterward. Let's see how bad staph infection gets. This little boy, his name is Jimmy. He's 12 years old, lives in Atlanta, Georgia. He's an excellent student, very good soccer player at school. One day he noticed something on his, list, uh, something on his leg right here. He showed it to his mom. It looked like this, started draining. That was the date. Uh, Mama too came to the doctor. First they put him on uh, oral antibiotics, did not touch it. They put a line, started IV antibiotics, did not phase it. Gradually he became septic. He had multi-organ failure. His kidneys shut down, his liver shut down. The doctor said, I have to save your life. They had to cut that leg. He's still playing soccer, but with one leg. And this is a healthy person in the community. Ladies and gentlemen, please protect yourself by doing standard precaution. The patient who is on isolation is not the one posing a danger. The one that we don't know what they have is posing the danger to the rest of us. This is the sign at the door. If you see this sign at the door, if I were you, I would not enter that room. But you have to have gloves and you have to wear gowns, no matter how much exposure you have with this patient. You have to have these equipments on before entering the room. Otherwise, you're posing a danger to yourself and the patient next door. It also causes pink eye. We tell our employees, if you have pink eye, do not come to work. They have to have 24 hours of antibiotics in their eye with improvement. It's extremely contagious. And it itches so bad that people cannot help touching their face. And the moment they touch that doorknob, staff can stay there for two weeks if they don't disinfect it properly. Two weeks. So. If you're visiting a patient and all of a sudden you realize patient is going down for whatever reason, you can do the condition H. H is for help. And it's just you pick up the phone and say the, uh, tell the operator, hey, I need the condition H. So help is going to arrive. And if it is false, if it's everything is OK, that's absolutely right. Uh, you can do that in order to protect the patient. And if you see this sign at the door, this patient is extremely immunosuppressed. Their body cannot fight infections. So please do not enter if you have cold or flu. We do not allow fresh flowers or fresh vegetables or fruits to this room because they bring organisms with them. These are usually chemo patients, transplant patients. So don't visit these people and if you go there, make sure you wash your hands and you have no upper respiratory infection. Now, it's quiz time. <laughs> Let's see what we have. What is this do-it-yourself vaccine that reduces the transmission of cold, flu, diarrhea, respiratory illnesses, and even Ebola? Thank you. Thank you so much. Absolutely. See, that was easy. Don't touch your T-zone. What is your T-zone? especially around this time of the year, never touch your face, exactly your mouth and nose and your eyes. Very good. What is the disease that kills more than 40,000 Americans every year and can be prevented by a vaccine? 
thank you. Absolutely. That's what it is. And lastly, what is this? Folks, I swapped this item myself. This is on an item that none of us had it 20 years ago. Now you cannot live without it. You take it to bed, you touch it even more than you touch your spouse, and that's what your cell phone is. So every, no really, it's filthy, filthy, filthy. So every so often, get a wipe and wipe your cell phone. It's gonna be fine. Thank you.